Welcome back, Crafted Entrepreneurs. Today we're going to talk about investments because this episode should actually expand your mindset to what is possible for you. This doesn't mean that I'm telling you that I think you should invest in these things. I'm just going to tell you my own personal story of how I've invested in similar things because I always think it's really powerful to hear how other people got started because it gives you hope that you're like not that far away <laughs> from doing things and you could go, okay, I want to do that or, okay, that sounds miserable. I have <laughs> no desire to do that, okay? So let's have fun as I share some investment stories with you. All right, so let's talk about alternative assets, okay? So a traditional asset is something like traditional stocks or bonds or cash. So it's something that the Federal Reserve treasures, <laughs> okay? Alternative assets are things like real estate, and you've heard me talk a ton about real estate, so I'm not gonna get into that on this episode today. But another alternative asset could be gold, which I do have some gold and silver. And the reason I got into gold and silver was because I listened to Robert Kiyosaki years ago, and he did, he wrote a book called Fake, and he talked about how, you know, the Federal Reserve is trillions of dollars in debt, and our cash, is worthless. And he said gold and silver never lose their value. And so anyways, I invested in some gold and silver. And I'm not against that at all. I think it's good to have. I could probably get more, but it hasn't been something that I'm like super passionate about looking into. The other thing I've been passionate about, as you guys know, is like picking up, you know, class B multifamily assets. So yeah, I think it's it's kind of like I was influenced by him. Everything made sense. And then when you talk to the broker, for like buying gold and silver, they will also educate you. But you have to remember like when brokers are educating you on things, they're getting paid in fees. So when they sell you a certain amount of gold or silver, they make a percentage off of that. So they are biased in the information that they give you. So always be diligent in doing your own research, okay? The next alternative asset is crypto currency, which I currently don't own any. I know Chase got into it for a while. And I don't know if he has any, honestly, because I think it's like on an app somewhere. <laughs> and I need I need to dial in Chase to find out. But this was pre, before we talked about investing in things together, we would just kind of do whatever we wanted with money. So he might have stuff in crypto. I don't because I do not understand it. So I came up with a rule after I invested in an AI deal about six years ago that I, and I cannot explain to you what I even invested in. <laughs> and I invested six figures into it. I came up with it after the fact of telling one of my friends who's a seasoned investor, much richer than me, what I had invested in. She goes, Kayla, you're not, you can't even explain what you just invested in. How did you just put six figures into this? And I go, well, you know, he said like in five years, it's going to, you know, 5X my money. So I thought it'd be a good investment and you want to get in before everybody knows about it. And she goes, Kayla, yeah, but there is a thing as investing too early. And like what you're going in right now is probably not even going to be sophisticated technology for another 10 to 15 years. And, it's, you know, six years later, the company is still... <laughs> I don't, I don't know where the money went. I don't know. I mean, I know they're trying, but like, I don't know if I'm ever going to see that money again. And so I learned after she kind of brought it to light, like, hey, you know, invest in things that you understand. Get educated. Because when you're educated, people can't pull one over on you. You know, you really need to understand what it is that you're buying into. Another asset is art and collectibles. People get really into this. Maybe when I'm super ultra rich, I'll be into this. But for now, I don't have any desire to do it because I feel like I've watched White Collar on Netflix and I'm like, there's so much counterfeit in that world. I don't want anything to do with it. Another one is hedge funds. So having people manage your money. And I think that's smart for me personally because of my own experience investing with financial advisors like years ago and kind of getting screwed on doing some big deals with them. I just personally don't trust anybody with my money more than me right now. Maybe that'll change. Again, I'm not always married to my philosophies. I'm open. I'm like, if I find something better, I'm going to do it. But right now, I think what I have that I'm investing in that's making me 30% a year on my money is, I don't know if a hedge fund's going to give me that. If you guys have a hedge fund, that does tell me private equity. And here I have several stories, but I'll tell you one. And this one is a deal where I bought shares in a private company 
And, you know, you do that in order, like you buy it in the beginning because maybe one day they're going to go public or they start to sell off part of their company to venture capitalists and they get a big cash infusion and then could potentially buy you out and you could make a multiple on your money. I've done this in several startup companies. I have a rule around startups and the rule is I only invest in one a year. And the reason I came to that rule is because I'm an ER nurse. Remember this about me, guys. And I don't know about you, but I get excited very easily. So like you could tell me about this new company that's getting started and how amazing it is and how it's going to change so many lives and how I'm going to love the product and you know everybody's going to love the product. And I have major FOMO and I'm like, I want to be a part of this right now. Like I will sell a kidney to get in on this deal if I have to. Like that's my personality because I <laughs> really struggle with FOMO. And God convicted me about this because every time that I have to go out there and make more money, you know, it takes time away from my family. And God keeps telling me like, you need to spend more time with your family, more time with your family. And so I need to pick investments that are the safer ones, that are a lot um, less risky than something like a startup. So 95% of startups don't make it. You'll, you'll never see your money back. Now, there are the ones that could hit it big. And so you have to, you know, go into these things knowing you're probably never gonna see that money. I don't like speaking that over an investment. I always pray. Just a couple of weeks ago, I invested $100,000 into a wellness company and I'm in the bank wiring the money and I'm over the paperwork, you guys. I'm like pleading the blood of Jesus over it. I'm like, I hope this is prosperous. I see this coming back to me in a multiple, like God changed lives with this company. Like I, I like to speak blessings over things that I invest in now. I think your words are seeds, your thoughts are seeds, and anytime you sow a seed, you should produce a harvest. So I choose certain things based on three parameters when I'm going to go into private equity deal. Number one is how much value can I add to this company with my network, with my experience, and with my skills? So let's, with this wellness company, this was a no-brainer for me because they need help with their affiliate program. That's number one expertise, you know, because I've been in that world for 13 years. It absolutely changed my life and I know how to build out structures that reward affiliates. Number one, I know I could add value in that way. So the reason why I have this stipulation is because I like to know that I have some type of skin in the game where let's say things are going south in this business, can I come in and make sure they're going north? You know what I mean? And I know with this, this is a huge needle mover being able to build a profitable affiliate program. So that was a yes. Number two, you gotta look at the CEO. You gotta look at who's in the C-suite, who owns the majority of the company and what kind of person are they? Because ultimately, like when you're investing in a startup, you're investing in that person. You're investing in the founder. And so this particular person, Amy Lacey, which she'll totally come on the podcast because we're actually launching a mastermind together. I'm so excited about this. It's called Faithful Founders. But Amy sold Cauliflower Foods for $50 million a couple years ago. So she has a track record. I've known Amy for about six years in business and outside of business. And she's very transparent. I love that about her. And she's also very well networked. So does she have the network to be able to potentially exit this company as quickly as possible? Yes. <laughs> so that's another thing. Is she investing her own money into this deal? She did. So she invested a lot of her own money into this. So she doesn't want to lose that money. And the reason why you asked that question for me in particular is there's other founders out there that will go do a capital raise and put zero of their own money in there. So I will never invest in a business again. And I, I didn't always be like this. OK, came up with these parameters a few years ago. <laughs> so learn from me. OK, I will never invest in a startup where the founder doesn't have their own skin in the game, period. End of story. Because they have nothing to lose. Yeah, they could lose time. They could lose their ego. But like if they don't have money to lose in the deal, I trust them a whole lot less with wondering if they did everything they could to make that company successful. And that's just my point of view. Like maybe I'll change later on. That's where I'm at today. You know, I just don't trust them. So I love Amy. She has her skin in the game. <laughs> okay, number three. Is there an exit plan within five years? That's important to me because, you know, in five years, I'm going to have adult children. That is so crazy to say, by the way, okay? I'm going to have adult children. And if I think about my perfect life, 
what do I want it to look like? Well, first of all, I have to have my private jet by this time. Okay, so you guys can hold me accountable because this is gonna be five years from now. I better have my private jet because I wanna be flying all over the country to watch my bubby play hockey. And hopefully he'll be in college playing his college hockey. And I wanna have a jet so I never miss a game. <laughs> and I need all a lot of this money that I've invested. I'm gonna want it to live on it and to reinvest and have a cash flow cow. I don't want something that's gonna be tied up for anything longer than five years at this point. What's your exit plan and what is your strategy? I wanna make sure that they're doing all of the things to be able to exit in five years. Like, can they actually do it? So really like asking those types of questions. What was cool about this deal is that we're also doing a profit share first year. So that's kind of unheard of in startups. Usually you will not see the money back until there's a public acquisition. So what she's doing is very unique in the fact that she's doing the profit share year one. So that got me excited because I'm like, I could potentially see this money back a lot quicker than five years and there's a profit share and the equity multiple. That's what it looks like for me. I negotiated a really good deal inside of that because of what I can bring to the table and also be on the board of that company. So check out Soursop Nutrition. It's the only Soursop gummy on the market. It is delicious and uh, my kids love it. My kids will have like 10 gummies a day and they're healthy for them. So it makes me excited because they think they're little fruit snacks and they're actually getting them healthy. Another awesome opportunity is getting into a venture capital fund. So a venture capital fund takes a business that is already doing pretty well. It has proof of concept and then they take that to multiply it and make it even bigger. So there's one VC fund that I've invested into in the past and they've done some pretty big deals. And one thing I'll say about the VC is that you have no rights to it. So once you pass over your money, so let's say you write a $100,000 check, it goes into the VC firm. You might never see that money and you have no say over that money. So you can't be like, hey, in a year, um, I want to help that company grow. It's like, what? Who are you? Like, well, doesn't matter. Like you're chump change in that VC, okay? And that VC deal. Like you're not going to know. You're going to get a quarterly little thing that says how the companies are doing that you're invested in. And the one thing I like about it is you go 100K into a VC firm. What's going to happen is they're going to diversify it. So you're going to get paid on how well that fund is doing. So maybe they're in 10 different deals and one deal goes bad, but the nine other companies are doing well, your money ends up making it. So it's a little bit safer of, I don't even wanna say it's safe because it's still risky as going into a private equity deal, but it's a little bit safer because you're able to diversify your money, but your returns will not be as big going into a VC because you have to pay all the fees that go along with it and it's a lot more watered down because you're getting paid out over the spread. Well, I, I won't continue to do VC funds. I've done it in the past. I still have money wrapped up in one and I'm not looking actively to be a part of any because I am doing technically peer-to-peer -peer lending. I like this a lot. It's something that Chase does in his business, My Abundant. You guys have seen him on the show, but in the Bible, it talks about be the lender, not the borrower. And so Chase and I, a few years ago, were constantly looking for ways to put our money into play. How quickly can I get this money that I've just been paid and get it out to start working hard for me, okay? And seeing a return quickly. So peer-to-peer -peer lending is a really cool opportunity. One example is like doing a private money loan for let's say if you know a fix and flipper. If you know an experienced real estate investor who does flipping, who has a track record for making profitable flips, you could become their private money lender. So let's say it looks like this. Hey, I'm flipping a home and uh, I need your $100,000 for 12 months and they might offer to pay you, you know, 8%. That's kind of like the going rate. Well, you could negotiate and you could just say, hey, well, I'll do it for 10%. Your money in a bank is not making that much. It's it's not making barely anything. Maybe you have it in a high yield savings account and it's making 4%. Uh, that's, that's great, but you want it to make more than that. So you can negotiate a deal with these people and say, hey, you know, I will loan you the money, but I actually want to get you know, a 50-50 split on the profit. You can go in and like know that you're holding a lot of power by being the lender here. So a lot of people uh, that I've actually worked with 
and coached that are private money lenders in the real estate space, they like to go in with the safer investment of just getting a promissory note on the deal and getting an 8% return, knowing that they're gonna get a guaranteed 8% return on their money. I don't like those types of deals because the person you're lending the money to that's flipping the home is gonna make a lot of money and I want a piece of the pie. So I'd rather take the risk and go, hey, I'll lend you this money. I'm still gonna get it backed by a promissory note, but on the profits, I wanna do a 50-50 split. And they might say no, but some will say yes. Some will say, absolutely, let's do it. And here's why I like it. As the lender, you're not doing any of the work. You're going to the expert who has a track record, who is good at what they do, they don't want to lose the money either because this is how this is their bread and butter. This is how they get paid. So they need it to be profitable. You're going in with a little bit of risk because guess what? Anybody knows this in the real estate market, there could be no profit. Like you might just break even. So you could just lend your money and make $0 off of it. To me, it's still less of a risk than going into a VC or going into a startup because it's backed by a hard asset. So even if you were to lose money on the flip, you still have that hard asset that's backed by land. So I like going in like that, knowing that I have negotiating power and that I can set the terms. So the person that I'm lending the money to is not the one that's gonna set the terms. When a lot of people who are capital raisers wanna be the ones that set the terms. And if you understand deal structure, you're gonna be able to go to them and say, no, what, you know what, this is what I'm available for. This is how I will lend my money. Maybe it's not the first five people you talk to. Maybe it's the next one that goes, okay, I'm fine with that. Get all signed off by your lawyer and you're good to go. The side note here is you need to make sure that you're lending money to people who have a track record or are they working with a mentor that is gonna help them along the way. Make sure that they are successful. Who has skin in the game here? So that way everybody's working hard to make sure that we're getting a profit back on this deal. And how are you securing this? So Usually private money loans are not secured by the SEC, but you can get it secured by just knowing where you are on the note and working with a real estate lawyer or um, a securities lawyer even, depending on what type of you know money you're lending. So knowledge is power. The more you get educated, the more you grow your network, the more you know. I know you're probably thinking in your mind, okay, so this is alternative assets. What about traditional assets? Kayla, what should I do if I want to invest in stocks and bonds? And I'll have to be honest with you. I am currently not invested in any of that. So even my retirement fund is a self-directed IRA. And if you guys want to learn more about that, you guys can go to self-directedira.com dot com forward slash craft. It'll also be in the show notes and you can learn everything about setting up a self-directed IRA so you could put it into alternative assets. There's a lot of great tax benefits that go along with this. But from my understanding and from everybody that I've worked with is that being in the alternative asset space will help you retire sooner and it helps you get an equity multiple much faster. Is it a little bit riskier? Yes, because you know if you're going and you're just putting money into an index fund, okay, let's say you have money in the S&P 500. These are just proven companies that will make you money over time, but they're not something that you're gonna get a big payout in five years like alternative assets. So what happens with alternative assets, this is just from my understanding and what I've actually seen and experienced is that you're getting the compound effect. So let's say I put $100,000 into a startup and it actually does bring me back an equity multiple of 2X, meaning in five years, I'm able to turn that 100,000 into $200,000. Maybe that could happen in the traditional market and it can happen in the traditional market, but maybe it would have taken 20 years to get there. So I go back in five years and now I have $200,000 to invest. So I'm, now I'm gonna go and put that $200,000 into play in alternative assets, still expecting a 2X multiple. And again, it doesn't always happen like this. I'm using these types of numbers to make it easier for you guys with math and for me. <laughs> So we have 200,000 on year five, put that into deployment. Well, on year 10, we now have another 2X equity multiple and we're at $400,000 in 10 years. 
Okay. And so that compound effect continues to happen again and again and again, because you're able to deploy the capital out into other investments that can bring you buku bucks. That's what I personally like. And if I think about it, I go, okay, let's say I invest $100,000 into this and I never see it again. How quickly can I make $100,000? I'm in the belief system. Remember, we talked about this in another episode when I taught you guys about emotional freedom technique. I can make $100,000 in a day. I can make $100,000 in an hour. Just a few weeks ago, I had somebody listen to my podcast, go to my social media, binge. This happens to be on a regular. This isn't a one-time thing, by the way. Binge my stuff on social media, then go back and binge my podcast is what she did. <laughs> listen to other podcasts that I was on. I get a DM from her saying, how do I work with you? And 24 hours later, we had gotten on a call and she had signed a contract to work with me for a year and wired me six figures. That's how quickly it can happen. But you have to be in the belief system that people are on their way to you right now to trade you money for what you know. That's just how I live my life. I know there's always people out there looking to be mentored by me. And they're willing to pay good money for it because they know the value that I bring to them is going to help them get to where they want to go a lot quicker. So I attract people like that into my life. I'm constantly looking for people like that in my life. And I'm doing the inner work on myself every single day to be ready to receive those people, to be in a good headspace to receive those people and to actually let those people fly and empower them to really follow their dreams. So how quickly can you recoup the money you've invested? And if you're like, Kayla, like there is absolutely no way, like I'm so far from believing that's true for me, then you shouldn't be investing $100,000 into a very risky deal because you need to work on your money mindset. You need to get into that place where you can make money easily and know that there are so many opportunities, especially in this day and age, for you to make money. Okay, so that was basically a master class on this podcast around alternative assets and some of the things I've invested in. And a lot of this comes from mistakes I've made, which is why I'm, I'm just so willing to share the mistakes with you guys because I don't want you guys to make the same ones. So if I could stress anything to you guys, it's get educated. You're doing the right thing by listening to this podcast. Don't just listen to my podcast. <laughs> Go and learn from the greats. I love Robert Kiyosaki. I love T. Harv Ecker. I mean, my husband's business partner is a mentor to me and he's he doesn't have a podcast but I need to have him on my podcast but he's a lot older than me you know he has a lot more experience and I'm constantly calling him saying what do you think just a couple months ago I was about to invest money into a merchandise company <laughs> and it wasn't like a private equity deal like I was going to get a really good deal so it wasn't a startup it's been around for like six years and I called him up and he goes absolutely not like he talked me off the ledge and he realized how like he helped me realize how dumb of a time investment and a money investment it was going to be. And so he saved me a lot of money. So have people like that in your corner. I call it the board of advisors that you can call on and glean from their wisdom. These have to be people that you'd be willing to trade places with um, because they have the same ethos as you, you know, the same value system as you. So it helps you on your path. I hope you enjoyed this episode. DM me if you have any questions.